Irwin Allen is, I think he's probably the epitome of what you could say. Here is a real great producer. He knew how to make a movie. It wasn't by committee, you know, it was by Irwin. He was definitely a character from a different time. He had a lot of energy, uh, really knew the business, was very, very dramatic. His exuberance was just ir irrepressible. Very charming guy. Um, very Hollywood. He was the cheapest man in the world, and he did everything he could at the very cheapest price, and that's why he was called a great producer. <laughs> Anything that is successful in Hollywood is considered a standout. And success is at the box office. No matter how good the picture may be, if nobody sees it, it isn't successful. And Irwin had a long record of successful films. Even if the picture wasn't a big hit or rat, he always had a big cast. He always had good people. He'd offer them a ton of money, and they would do the films. Yeah, I was also in The Swarm, <laughs> which was not quite up to uh, Towering Inferno. <laughs> He knew exactly what he wanted, uh, and it was all storyboarded out, and all you had to do was say yes and go do it. I'd lay it out and have the uh, panels up on the wall when they come in, and they could actually see themselves in the movie, and Irwin actually felt that that was a pretty fine selling point. I think he's one of the last of the truly original producers who would never take no for an answer, and were full of ideas and and, and uh, outrageousness. The main thing I remember about Irwin is I was fascinated by his hair. Not to be unkind and excuse me, Irwin, but Irwin had the most incredible head of hair. He had a full head of hair, but he didn't have a full head of hair. It was a do that just, you couldn't figure it out. It was combed in a way, an incredibly complicated manner, so that from any distance, it looked like he had an abundant full head of hair. But once you got it closer, you could see all this all the medieval intertwining. Twirled and whirled. It must have taken hours and hours in the morning to do this. It was a construction. And he never alluded to it. I remember occasionally walking up behind him when he was directing over here. And I would try to figure out what he had done. And he always knew. He would always turn around. The instant you gave his hair that kind of focus, he had a kind of hair radar. It was pre-Donald Trump, let's put it that way. <laughs> Please forgive me, Irwin. You'll come back and strike me. I didn't quite know what to think of him with his hairdo and his um, suits that he wore. One day, he invited me to lunch. And I said, oh, that's great. The producer's taking me to lunch. He picked me up in his cream-colored Rolls-Royce convertible, and he took me to Jack in the Box drive-in. And I said, I don't eat meat. What are you doing here? Oh, this is my favorite. You're going to love it. I said, no, I'm not going to love it. I'm not going to eat it, you know. I, <laughs> I don't eat meat. I'm sorry. So I think I didn't eat that day, but... Um, then I, I said, why did he do that? Was that a joke? It, it, you know, why would he do that to me? I came to find out from his wife later that it was his favorite restaurant. It was a high honor for him to take me there. <laughs> and so I spurned it, and I probably crushed him at that. He never invited me again to lunch. <laughs> Jesus, we're going to really get arrested for that. <laughs> it was fun working with Erwin L, actually, because he, had, he was just a fun guy. And he was like a little kid to me. You know, they always say little boys don't grow up. I think that was true with him. Irwin was wide open to any suggestions. He'd give him 10 variants on a theme. He'd use all 10, because he just couldn't get enough. He was very, very susceptible to falling in love with the subject matter. He was so receptible. He was patient. He had a funny temper, though. He would just, he was wildly intense. And if he'd get upset, I would have to turn away, because I, I, it would make me laugh. He was so intense. It's not that you could do no wrong with him. You could just, you could not give him enough. And you could see most of it on screen. In reality, when you have that type of fire, you're going to have uh, a tremendous amount of smoke. So I told Irwin, I said, you know, there's not enough smoke in this scene. And so Irwin says, come on, let's take a walk. <laughs> so Irwin puts his hand on my shoulder, and we walk around to the backside of the stage. and. 
He says, uh, there's something about the movie business I need to share with you. If people can't see the stars' faces, they won't buy tickets. <laughs> and they come to the movies for the action and to see the stars. Erwin was a really great and good friend. He was a very generous man. He really was. Very outgoing, great personality, very warm. Erwin was very loyal, and he always brought back Myself. He had a group of people that if you were part of that group, well, that, that's great. That was really good. There were always baskets at Christmas, and uh, anytime kids would come through, he'd be handing out plastic models of the Nautilus submarine, and uh, he was just a really a kind of a larger-than-life guy. I loved him. I loved him. I mean, he was funny. He was great to work with. When you worked for him, you were part of his family, and uh, the motion picture industry was basically his, you might say, his entire life. And he was just a great guy, a really wonderful person, a great showman. When you get people like Erwin Allen, he puts on a big circus. And so he put a lot of people to work. We miss Erwin. <laughs>